Join me in your Bibles in Mark chapter 9. As you're turning there, I do want to acknowledge our graduates. We have a gift for you that we are going to give you at the end of service. And so at the end of service, just so you know what to prepare for, I'm going to ask John and Lexi to come up front here with their parents. We're going to present them with a gift, and then we're going to pray over them instead of having a normal invitation, okay? So just so you know what to expect toward the end of the service. We're in Mark chapter 9, verse 42 this morning. I'm going to do my best to keep things as succinct as I possibly can, uh, knowing the hour, and uh, save your Snickers for later, okay? All right, whatever. I have to acknowledge something. I love, I love Mission Sunday. For, for a couple of reasons. One, it just speaks to our mission every month, and I look forward to hearing about what God is doing around the world. Two, I love it because it's real. I so appreciate Mr. Neal's heart, and I appreciate what's going on around the world because it gives us an idea. Sometimes we get so insulated in our little existence. We're in a little bubble in our culture from the rest of the world, and we forget what it's like. Maybe we've never had any experience what it might be like around the rest of the world, and, it, and it's real. And it, it reminds me of something that we wrestle with all the time. We wrestle with the fact that much of our world is superficial. So much of our existence is artificial. We have all this digital connection now, and and our, our culture is more connected than it's ever been, but yet people are farther apart maybe than they ever have been. And that, that we wrestle with that. There's no real authenticity in relationships. And I think that's one of the reasons why small groups resonated with this body so much is because it brought authenticity and genuineness to bear as we live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a thrilling thing. But in our culture, everything seems to be skin deep. And we wrestle against that. And regrettably, some of the same superficiality that we see in culture and in the world is also found within the body of Christ. It shouldn't be, but sadly it is. And so we want genuine, we want authentic, we want real, but sometimes it just seems so far away. It seems so out of reach. And that's where we find this text. Because in our text, Jesus has some strong words to say about authentic discipleship, about genuine Christianity, about what it really means to follow him. And I want you to read these verses with me, beginning in Mark chapter 9 and verse 42. Jesus there says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but you can sense the timbre of what Jesus is saying. These are strong, very pointed, very powerful words about genuine discipleship. Verse 43, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And so Jesus rounds out the chapter here with some strong words about authentic discipleship. Now, just in case you think this might be out of character for Jesus, extreme on his part, and thereby making it irrelevant because it's an outlier, I would invite you to consider with me for just a moment the body of his teaching on what it really means to follow him. It was his habit to call people to repentance. That was how he began his ministry, preaching the kingdom of God, calling people to repent. It was his regular invitation to invite people to a life of self-denial, and cross-bearing. 
That metaphor was very powerful to the New Testament Jew. Cross-bearing meant one thing. It meant death. Public, excruciating execution. And so Jesus' regular invitation was one of self-denial and cross-bearing. He would invite people to lose their lives for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. He would invite people to hate their own life in comparison to their love for him. To be willing to forsake their closest family ties and their closest earthly friendships for the sake of his kingdom. And so we put all of that together and we understand that the demands he makes here in Mark chapter 9 are in keeping with the rest of his teaching. This is what it really means to follow Jesus. Jesus is not a tag. He's not one among many. He is the one and only. He's not something we add to an already busy life. He is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And so we take that and we look at this text and we realize that a discipleship revolution occurs here. It allows us to see beyond the superficial that we wrestle with. We get down to brass tacks, as it will, and we can deal in terms of genuine and authentic and real. And I would suggest to you that according to Jesus' teaching that that is possible even in our culture. As artificial as things seem, and as skin deep as they may be, we can have genuine, authentic discipleship even in our culture. And so I want you to notice with me three things from the text. You can follow along in your outline in the bulletin or on the app. But I want you to notice, for a discipleship revolution to take place and genuine Christianity to take root, three things must happen. Number one, look with me at verse 42. We cannot cause others to stumble. If we're going to be authentic, real, genuine followers of Jesus Christ, then we can't afford to be stumbling blocks to other believers. Let's let's walk through verse 42 together because Jesus uses hyperbole, a graphic metaphor to prove his point. And he talks about little ones there. And at at first glance, you may think he's talking about children, but I would invite you to remember that children are emblematic of the kingdom. And so he's speaking about believers here. And the warning is against causing other believers to stumble into sin and fall away from following Jesus Christ. And this is a serious matter. It's one that we ought to take very seriously According to the text, Jesus makes his point very strongly, and I want to encourage you to see this as a matter of perspective, as a matter of willingness, and a decision that we make beforehand as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying it would be better for you to die a horrible death, in this case have a heavy millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean and drown than it would be to cause another believer to stumble. The point is that we would rather die than cause a fellow believer to sin. That's the attitude that Jesus is suggesting that we take on. That's the perspective that we must have for a discipleship revolution to take place. We'd rather die. And I have to admit something to you. That's not a perspective that I often think of. When I'm thinking about my relationship to you as my brothers and sisters in Christ, as, as your pastor, as your, as your brother, as your sister, I, I want you to think that through with me about how that relates to even maybe members of your own household, members of your church. Jesus makes this point very, very strongly. Would you rather die than cause a brother to stumble? Would you rather die than for somebody to stumble over you and enter the kingdom of heaven? I know what you're thinking because I thought it too, and I want to I parse this out so we understand it correctly because we need to reconcile this with the freedom that we have in, in Christ. I'm not suggesting legalism or that we take some kind of stringent approach 
here. We are free in Christ, and our liberty in Christ is not to be judged by another's conscience. Yet, in that same passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all that we do should be done for God's glory. And as we set out to do all that we do for God's glory, we should choose beforehand not to give offense. And so my admonishment to you is this, straight from the scriptures, if we're going to choose not to be a stumbling block, then we, just like we've been talking about all along for the last several weeks, we have to choose to put other people first. To love them as we love ourselves. To look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. That's the mind of Christ, and that's his teaching here. And so we're to live as people who are free. 1 Peter 2 and 16. But we're not to use our freedom as a cover-up for evil, but we're to live as servants of God. And we're not to use our freedom, according to Galatians 5 and 13, as an opportunity for the flesh. Christ did not set us free so that we can do as we please, whatever we want, to satisfy our lusts and our desires, but rather he set us free so that we can love people and serve one another. That's Galatians 5 and 13. If we cause another to stumble, very simply, friends, listen to me. We're not walking in love, Romans 14, 15. We're not loving other people like we love ourselves. We're not putting them before us if we're willingly causing them to stumble. And so for a discipleship revolution to take place, number one, we have to agree that we are not going to cause other people to stumble just by way of priority. That's in verse 42. But now I want you to look with me at verse 43 through 48. This is where maybe we get down to a, a more direct application to us personally. We must deal decisively with sin, our own sin. So we, we choose by way of priority, not to cause others to sin, verses 43 through 48 mean that we choose not to cause ourselves to sin, that we deal decisively with our own temptations. Again, Jesus uses strong language here. We need to remove anything and everything that might cause us to sin with extreme prejudice. Now, look back with me at the text, because if we take Jesus literally here, you would think he's advocating some kind of self-mutilation, right? That, that if our eye is a stumbling block to us, then we tear it out. And, and if we take that literally, then we, we're removing our eyes, we're removing our hands, we're removing our feet. But, but such severity, according to Colossians 2 and 23, does nothing to curb the appetites of the flesh. That that kind of self-mutilation does nothing to stop the indulgence of our own sinful desires. And so rather than take what Jesus says literally and that we mutilate ourselves, let's again see it as a matter of perspective. The foot, the eye, the hand suggest something to us. The places that we go, the things that we see, the things that we do all need to be dealt with if they cause us to sin. And so we, therefore, must radically exercise any duties, any activities, any entertainments that might cause us to stumble into sin. Does that make sense? That if we're going somewhere on our weekly routine, if we're stopping by a store or we're traveling by someone's house that is a temptation for us, then we need to remove that activity from our daily routine. That's the teaching here. And that if we're watching something, whether it's on TV or on the computer or on our phone, that is a cause for us to sin, then we radically exercise that with extreme prejudice, with the same kind of aggressiveness that would cause us to cut off our own hand or our own foot. We remove that kind of temptation. And so I want you to see this as a matter of perspective again. Such efforts might be painful, but they are necessary and they are worthwhile if a discipleship revolution is going to take place. It would be better for us to enter into eternal life than with those things intact, would it not? 
I would rather lose a limb. This is the perspective. This is the attitude that must take root. I would rather lose a limb or an eye than sin against God. Is that how strongly we feel about our own temptations? And look, I get it. We live in a digital world, and that's one of the things, that, that's one of the phenomenon that exists in our culture when everything is so artificial and superficial that we can entertain things and it never be known. And, and, and the reality of the matter is, if you allow me to be very, very poignant with you, looking at the statistics, looking at the numbers, over half of the men in this audience have viewed pornography this week. Look at the numbers. And that some of you are using the app on your phone and that there's a very real chance that some of you will go home this afternoon and with the same phone that you're now taking notes on in this service, you will view some kind of illicit materials. That's the danger of the superficial environment that we live in, that everything is on the surface and nothing is ever dealt with. But our attitude should be such that we would rather lose a limb or an I, than to sin against God. Than to give place for temptation and therefore a foothold for the devil and the satisfaction of our own flesh. And that's just one example. There are other things. Are there not? So, so that might look differently for all of us. Some of us may need to fast just to prove that, that food doesn't have uh, uh, control over us. Or that, that we may need to decide we're going to go ahead and pay the penalty and cut the contract with the cable company because there's too many things on there that cause us to be tempted and, and therefore to, to sin against God. And so, hey, what, what's a couple dollars in view of eternity, right? Isn't that what Jesus is teaching here by way of principle? You know, and, and, and I realize that if, if you go back and have the flip phone, that, that all of your friends at school might think that you're a nerd. And, and okay, so what? What is that in light of eternity? What is it? Does it really matter if you have a data plan on your phone? If it's causing you to sin in light of eternity? Think this through. And as we deal radically with sin, the expectation I want to encourage you here is not perfection. It's not perfection. Jesus is not suggesting perfection here. He's telling us that we have to strive against sin. That it's a call to resist temptation, striving against sin in our own lives, even to the point of shedding our own blood. That's Hebrews 12 and four, and it's one of the chief evidences of the new life. Eternal life is a present possession revealed by a heart that says no to temptation. That we're willing to do what it takes so that we don't sin against God. Now hear me on this too, because as we put this together, if eternal life is evidenced by a heart that says no to sin, we also have something that is presented to us on the contrary here, that a, a, that a love for sin, a fostering of sin, well, that's not genuine faith at all. And according to Jesus' words, what does that mean? It means that hell awaits, not heaven. And you might be surprised to learn something here, that Jesus talked more about heaven than he did about hell, and or more about hell, rather, than he did about heaven, excuse me. And that he talked more about hell than anyone else in the entirety of the Bible. That he's the direct source of much of what we know from the scriptures about the doctrine of hell. And so that tells us something. And frankly, if it had come from anyone else, we might consider it suspect. But because of the source, we have every reason to believe hell is as much a biblical reality as heaven. Right? Right? It's as much as a reality as heaven. And so this parabolic language connects us to Jewish history here. And, and let me quickly give you the history lesson. I'm almost done, I promise. Just so that we understand what Jesus is talking about here. 
Because hell was a reality for Jesus. It was a reality for the people that he ministered to. Every time he confronted somebody who was oppressed by a demon, they understood their eternal fate. And so we must come to terms with this. And Jesus takes us back using this language about hellfire, where the the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. Those are, those are metaphors that tie us to Israel's history, to the reigns of two particular kings in Israel's history, King Ahaz and King Manasseh. They were wicked, idolatrous kings. And under their reign, the people of Israel became idolatrous to the point that they built these high places up on top of the hillsides outside of Jerusalem, instead of worshiping in the temple, they would go out to these hilltops, and there they would, they would worship their pagan gods. In particular, Jesus is referencing the worship of Molech and Baal. And on these high places, they would be immoral. They would fornicate. And I don't mean to be graphic, but that's exactly what they would do as they worshiped their pagan deities. And then as they became more and more entrenched in this idolatry, they would sacrifice the children that were born to them through their fornication. And so they, would, they began sacrificing their own children to these gods. And this all took place in uh, the Valley of Hinnom, outside of Jerusalem, known at this time, it was called Gehenna. And that's the word Jesus uses here for hell, Gehenna. And, and so, if you think with me through, think, with, think this through with me about what was taking place and this metaphor that Jesus is using, connecting them to eternal punishment. They committed acts of sin in their idolatrous relationships to their pagan gods. They sacrificed their children to these pagan gods under the reigns of Ahaz and Manasseh. Josiah comes along. He takes the throne. Revival sweeps over the nation. He reforms... Israel, and they turned this valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, into the garbage dump. So they cover it up with trash. They set it on fire. That becomes the burying place for animals and criminals. And so in Jesus' day, think this through, what this place looked like, Gehenna. The fire never died out consuming the constant stream of garbage that was being dumped there by the people of Jerusalem. That it was crawling with maggots because of the bodies and the animals that were buried there. Such was the image that Jesus uses for eternal punishment. And this all leads us to a necessary point. It is Jesus' point. Everyone must repent of their sin or eternal punishment awaits. I hope you understand. And I know we all kind of bristle because of, uh, of decades gone by of hellfire and brimstone preaching, but the message that those preachers preached to us is true, and it resounds from this text, everyone must repent of their sin or eternal punishment awaits. Putting these things together, we must be careful not to cause others to stumble. And then personally, we must be willing to take drastic measures to remove temptation. We must take what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 to heart, that we must put to death what is earthly in us. Put it to death. Kill it. Deal decisively with your own temptation. It must happen for a discipleship revolution to take place. And now, on a much more positive note, we can round out our teaching this morning with number three, and I want to give this to you quickly. We must dedicate ourselves to a life of sacrifice. Look with me at verses 49 through 50. Now, oddly, these verses have perplexed Bible scholars, maybe more than any other, there are as many as 15 different interpretations of verses 49 and 50. I don't, I don't really know why. Other than verse 49 and 50 are, are according to 
Hebrew scholars and according to Greek scholars and New Testament scholars, the most difficult to interpret of all Jesus' teachings. Let's, let's look at one thing in particular, just so that we can make some clear application and, and we don't get off the road into the ditch, okay? According to John MacArthur, the meaning of this cryptic and difficult saying is best understood by looking at the laws in Leviticus concerning the grain offering. There are specific commands from God about sacrifices that were to be burned that were also mixed with salt. Listen to Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13. God commanded the people of Israel, you shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Now that meant something to the Hebrew people. And now while we don't live under the sacrificial system, I can assure you because of Jesus' teaching, it means something to us too. And so let's understand what it means. God commanded salt to be offered, added to the sacrifices when they were burned as a symbol of the covenant that he had made with them. That this was a symbol of God's enduring promise to the people of Israel and therefore, it was a symbol of their enduring commitment to him. To say that everyone will be salted with fire reveals that Jesus' expectation for us as his followers is to perpetually be offering our lives as a sacrifice to him. It is something that we do, and we continue to do, and we continue to do. This becomes very clear in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 through the teachings of the Apostle Paul. This is the covenant that we in turn make with God. He has redeemed us through his shed blood, ratifying the covenant of grace through faith through the death of his son. That's the covenant that he makes with us. We enter into that relationship with him by faith, and our covenant is ratified with him. This is the covenant that we make with him by perpetually offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. We are consecrated to him. Presenting our bodies as that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, that is our spiritual service of worship. Reasonable, and it's expected. This is what Jesus demands from all of us. And so as we make some practical application here, don't you find it interesting that Jesus also tells us to be at peace? After he tells us to have salt within ourselves, he also tells us to be at peace among ourselves. Fitting challenge earlier in the chapter, you remember the disciples were bickering and arguing over who was the best. Who was number one? Mark 9, 34. They were trying to figure out, Jesus had just taught them about his crucifixion and death and resurrection, and they were trying to figure out who was first to take his place. And so this meant something, I can assure you, to these hyper-competitive men that were trying to figure out who was number one. And it also serves as a final call for radical discipleship for us to be at peace among ourselves as we try to navigate the superficial, skin-deep Christianity that is so present in our culture. Here's what I believe Jesus meant. I believe that that if he were here today, and, and if he were teaching this text to us, that he would look at us and call us fellow servants of God. And as fellow servants of God, we are expected to make equal sacrifices to God. That the discipleship revolution requires total surrender from every one of us. And that's where we find equality. That the expectation is the same for every single one of us. Jesus wants all of you. No more, no less. And no one is exempt. It is, was his expectation of Peter and James and John and the rest of the twelve. It was his expectation of Paul when he found him on the Damascus Road, 
And it is his expectation of you, no matter where he found you. He wants all of you. And that is his expectation of every single one of us. It is the same for us all. No, wasn't it, no one is exempt, and therefore no one is expected to give more than all of who you are. Does that make sense? And, and I think maybe that's a fitting message considering the subject of our day today, being that it's Mission Sunday and being that we're about to honor two young people who have just graduated from high school. That God's expectation for you has as much to do with the kind of person that you are, the offering that you are, than it does about where you will go and what you will do and who you will marry and who you do will do business with and where you will live. God wants you to live in total surrender for the rest of your life. That you are to have salt within yourself, be salted with fire, present yourself a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable as your reasonable service or worship. And if you'll do that, you will live and abide in the teachings of Christ and in his favor the rest of your life. And I think that's a powerful truth, not just for our graduates, but for all of us. Amen? A discipleship revolution is necessary because we are the only true salt of the earth. And so I want to ask you to do something with me as we round out our service this morning. I'm asking you to do three things based on, what we, uh, based on what we've heard. Three things. I want you to live as free people. That, it, that if you are in Christ and you have been set free, that don't be a stumbling block. We're not bound to the religious rites of old, the Old Testament practices. We're not legalists. We're saved by grace through faith. And in that, Christ Jesus has set us free. But we're not to be a stumbling block. And so decide beforehand that you are not, in your freedom, going to cause other people to stumble. That's what true discipleship looks like. Secondly, kill the temptation. Kill it. Put it to death. I mentioned before, fast. Cancel the contract. Go ahead and end the relationship. All of that pales in comparison to entering into life eternal and, and you can have that quality of life even now and so you need to repent as we kill the temptation and then thirdly surrender all of it all of you nothing held back all of those ugly parts of you that you don't want anybody else to know about god already knows about them he knows more about them than you do. Because Jesus Christ bore the eternal consequences of those things, those things on his cross. That he took them to his grave and put them to an open shame. That he knows more about those ugly parts of you than you do. And so his invitation to you is just to surrender them. All of them. To you. All of those things that might cause you to be self-righteous and prideful. All of those things that you might find some pride in the things that might give you some self-worth. Surrender those two. Because his expectation of you is the same that he had for his disciples. It's the same that he's had for everyone who has ever chosen to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. So surrender. Surrender. Let's pray together and then as we're praying, I want to invite the, uh, the graduates to the front here, and we're going to present them with a gift and their families. I want you to join them if you don't mind. And so let's do this. Let's pray as they make their way forward. Father, I pray that you would help us to have salt in ourselves. That in this moment where we are listening to the Holy Spirit, having received the word of God, Help us to be willing to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. That we would be willing to live 
as free people under the grace of God. But we would decide that we're not going to be a stumbling block. We're not going to be the cause of other people's sins. And that we're going to deal radically with our own. We're going to kill the temptation in our lives and and, and with the same kind of prejudice that you described in the scriptures, cutting off our hands, cutting off our feet, plucking out our own eyes, that we are going to remove temptation from our lives. And that we will live as a perpetual offering, a living sacrifice to you. Prayer for our graduates this morning. They represent so much potential. Lord, I pray that you would Help them to surrender everything that is in them to you this morning. These two young people have been saved. Lord, their families are faithful in our church. They are serving the Lord. Both of them are actively serving here and now. But, but may today be an Ebenezer stone in their lives. May it be a sign, a, a token of remembrance for them, for their families, that they have surrendered everything to you. And as we present them with their gift, every time they lay eyes on it, may they be reminded of their commitments. Having entered into a relationship with you, that covenant with you, this is their commitment to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is their reasonable service. May that be true of us all today for your glory, Lord, and for the sake of your kingdom. For the sake of the gospel in the world, may that be true of us all In Jesus' name we pray, amen.